Edinburgh is a city by the sea. But not everyone is turned outwards towards the ocean. That's why the Scottish Storytelling Festival invites you on a journey of Edinburgh's coastline, beginning here at Fisher Row, just into East Lothian, all the way to South Queen's Ferry. Come and explore Edinburgh, the blue city. Fisher Row was in its heyday. The harbour was loud with the sounds of the fishwife singing, their knives flashing as they gutted the catch. Loud too, with boats coming in groaning with fish and with gulls making a racketing cry. The harbour was busy with men sitting on the wall, mending their nets and watching the weather. Mary McIntyre was a fishwife with her blue striped apron. She had a fine singing voice, did Mary. Now her mother was a fishwife. So was her grandmother, her cousins and her friends. And blue-eyed Andrew Galbraith, her sweetheart, he was a fisherman. So was his father, his grandfather, his cousins and his friends. And when the two were wed, some farming folk came down from the fields by Inveresk and after a good few drams, they stood up and prophesied that any bairn born to this salty couple will likely have webs between its fingers and scales upon its skin. Whether it was to do with these predictions or whether it was the great deal of fish that Mary ate in her pregnancy or whether it was the bonny shell necklace that Andrew gave her as a wedding gift. The fact of the matter was that a year after the wedding, Mary had a little baby and, according to the midwife, she has the briny whiff of the sea about her. Well, Mary's heart thumped remembering these predictions and she tugged at the blanket around her newborn bairn, shocked to see tiny little webs between her fingers and the faintest trace of scales upon her skin. Do not fret, said the midwife. There's bairns born that way. It just means they have the sea in them. Yourself a fishwife, your man a fisherman, you can't deny it. But Mary McIntyre was determined to try. Mary herself was a proud enough fishwife. But she knew that the life was hard, especially in winter. Oh, her hands red raw with the icy water and her back bent over with the weight of the creel in the skull. To say nothing of her poor head made bald with that leather strap chaffing. Aye, fishwife, that was the old ways. Mary wanted something new for her daughter. The sea gave, but the sea also took. And Mary was determined it would not take her daughter. So when the wee lassie, who she called Rona, was four years old, Mary persuaded Andrew to leave Fisher Row and to go into Edinburgh to seek a new life. Well, they lived in a cramped wee tenement. Andrew found work cleaning a tram, Mary cleaning houses but they were not happy. And there was no songs on their lips and they never ate fish. And whenever Mary did see a fishwife hawking her wares and calling out, I have fish to buy, I have fish to buy, Mary turned her back and shook her head. For three years in Edinburgh town, they sold it. But everything changed. 
on the morning of Rona's seventh birthday. It was winter time. She woke up early because of the moon, the full moon shining through her window. Well, whether she was awake or dreaming, it's hard to tell, but it seemed to her that the moon was calling, go back to the sea, follow me. And Rona slipped out of bed. Her mother was asleep. Her father was out working. And Rona crept out of that wee flat and she ran down the high street and through the King's Park, all the time following the silver path of the moon. Follow me, come back to the sea. Through Meadowbank, Pierce Hill, and all the way down to Portobello, she ran. And by now, the moon had set and it was the sun rising in the east. And she followed it all the way to Fisher Row. And when she got there, she came to the beach. Ha! With a smile on her face for the first time in three years. Well, when her mother awoke to wish her happy birthday, her mother's heart sank. For where was Bonnie Rona? She had gone. Andrew said, She's gone to Fisher Row, I feel it in my bones. And the two of them ran from the high street all the way back to Fisher Row. By now, the sun was high in the winter sky. And there was Rona, sitting on the beach, playing with shells. And she laughed. It's my birthday, she said. And an oyster catcher piped shrilly. Andrew persuaded Mary to return to the creel and he would return to the sea. It's in us, he said, and the sea is in our lassie, you can't deny that. And Mary had to admit it was. Can I be a fishwife when I grow up, Mammy? We Rona cried, and with a smile on her face, Mary said, I lass. And so it was that Rona, bonnie Rona with the beautiful skin, she grew up to be a fishwife. And what a fishwife she was, the fastest fish gutter in the whole of Fisher Row, and like her mother, a bonnie singer. And Rona, often she delighted in stretching her fingers wide and showing the wee webs between her fingers. I'm proud to be a fisher wife, fishwife, she said. Cara lives in Portobello, right by the sea. There's a real seaside feel to the place with ice cream vans and cafes, a long stretch of sandy beach, and in summer, the constant bustle of people along the prom. Cara's friends are envious. They're just so lucky to live here, they say. But it doesn't seem that way to Cara. Not at the moment. For months now, since October really, she's felt this dark presence, always there, sapping her energy. It had stolen into her life suddenly, silently, like a thief in the night, robbing her of light and joy and laughter. At first she had put it down to long days at work, too many sleepless nights, nothing that a spice latte and a cinnamon bun couldn't cure. But then, as the days got colder and darker, so did her mood, spiralling downwards, unravelling. At last she went to the doctors. He gave her pills, signed her off work for a while. She'd felt that dark, heavy presence closing in around her, snatching away the last of the light. 
Her friends had phoned and texted, but after a while, Kyra had stopped answering. She'd stayed in bed later each morning, not wanting to face the day. She'd spent all winter curried in, seeing no one, just buying what she needed online. But now, this morning, she pushes herself to go out for a walk along the beach. It's February, there are few people around, just a lone gull and a cormorant dressed in its cloak of dark feathers, drying its wings on one of the wooden groins. After being inside for so long, it's a surprise to smell the salt air, to feel the wind whip through her hair, and to see, there in the sea, women swimming. She can hardly believe it. She's hacked up in her scarf and her big winter coat, and here are women bobbing around in the water, wearing woolly hats and bright smiles. She watches them from a distance, these women of the sea. She can hear them too, they're noisy, yelling and laughing and shrieking. As she watches, one of them wades out of the water wearing a red hat, black swimsuit, black gloves and black neoprene boots. The woman's beaming from ear to ear. She pulls on an oversized red coat and pours herself a mug of tea from a flask. Kara turns to go, but the, the woman calls to her. That was amazing. And Kara can see it in the woman's smile, in her radiant glow. She would like some of that radiance. She'd like to wade into the water, to yell, to shriek, to laugh with the cold shock of it. For a moment, that dark presence that had stolen away her joy seems a little fainter. You should try it, calls the woman in the red hat. Oh, I'd freeze to death, says Kara. No, not to death, you'll freeze into life. But I don't have the, the gloves or the boots. That's no problem, says the woman, I've got some spare. You just need a swimsuit and a hat. Look, we'll be here tomorrow at 8.30 if you want to give it a try. Just bring some tea, you'll, you'll need something to warm yourself up with later. In that moment, the tide turns. That night she dreams of seals, blue oceans, the steady rhythm of the waves. Early next morning, as she's making her way to the beach, she notices that in the east, the sky is tinged with pink. And there, on the horizon, there's a sliver of light. And here's the woman with the red hat waving at her. Well done, you made it, she calls. I'm Maggie, by the way, ready for your first swim. The first small wave is a shock, even wearing the neoprene boots. She yelps with the cold, but she carries on. Part of her scared, but the other part feeling more alive and awake than she's felt for months. She takes a deep breath, pushes herself forward, and then she's swimming and yelling and laughing and shrieking. Later, standing on the beach, drinking tea, Maggie tells her about a group of women that meet every Sunday, the Wildians. You'd be welcome to join us. I'd love that, says Kara. 
on International Women's Day in March, Kara is one of 700 women swimming at sunrise in the sea in Portobello. By now, she has her own gloves and neoprene boots, and she can swim for 10 minutes each day in the cold North Sea. She wades in, part of this bright sea of women, watching the tip of the sun here just above the hills beyond Musselburgh. Some of the women run in and straight back out again, but Kara swims out further, gliding easily through the water. It feels like coming home. As she feels the first warm rays of the sun on her skin, she swims out further and further. And then she feels a presence alongside her. Maybe another woman who's as bold as she is. She turns and for a moment, she looks directly into the warm, dark eyes of a seal. Then it dives back down under the waves and is gone. As she swims back to the shore, and to the crowd of women now gathered there, the sun rises full above Portobello. Many important moments in Scottish history have taken place here in the port of Leith. Mary Queen of Scots' mother ruled Scotland from here, from what is now known as Parliament Street. It's been the site of a sectarian siege, the port where rats carrying the fleas that spread the Great Plague of 1645 landed and eventually wiped out half of the local population, both here in Leith and in neighbouring Edinburgh. There are rumours of fairy drummers puzzling respected aristocrats in these very streets. Throughout the ages, Leith has been a hub of industry. The docks were a mighty hymn to engineering, to worldwide seafaring, to ships like combine harvesters, to technical ingenuity. Today the ships leave to explore the Arctic and feats of engineering innovate ways to crack the ocean bed and extract the black gold of North Sea oil, fueling our carbon-based economy. In times past, it was not crude oil, but the oil of the great whale that kept the oil lamps flickering and banished the darkness of a winter's eve. The first whaling ships left in the 1600s, heading for frigid Atlantic waters. Strong arms cast harpoons into the bodies of these great oceanic beasts. Blood would spurt skyward and turn the green sea red. Whalers would clamber their bodies like mountains. The hacking, the sawing, the cutting would be begin as they would retrieve their blubbery bounty. It was harsh work. The conditions were awful. Starvation, frostbite. Disease, scurvy and even death were possible consequences for the whalers. Many hundreds of ships were lost. But for those that returned, it could be a very profitable enterprise. Especially for those that had bought the ships. Especially for the ship's owners, rather than the whalers themselves. Technological progress led to the development of the mechanised harpoon. Trips to the north became much more efficient. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of whales were dragged back from the cold Atlantic waters. Whale populations were decimated as their bodies fueled the, the growth of our economy. Profits rose as whale populations fell and our oceans were the poorer for it. 
We ignored the voices of indigenous people that told us that the whale was our ancestor, was a friend, was a companion. That whilst they gave their body so the people could live, they were to be held sacred in prayer and ceremony. We ignored these voices that told us that when we extract from the earth and give nothing in return, and when we think of nothing but raw profit, then we, as well as all beings on this planet, are much the poorer for it. We live on a blue planet. From far above, looking down on the earth, we may see how the oceans, how the seas dwarf the land, and how from such a perspective, it may be the whales that are the true dominant species here on earth. And maybe there's something we can learn from them. They become the dominant species without killing their own kind, without letting their numbers grow to unsustainable levels. They are powerful yet peaceful, intelligent and caring. They prior prioritize language and communication. Their song can travel 500 miles through the water and it uses subtle sequences and phrasing to build relationships. These relationships of the whale include elaborate courtship, ecstatic love, and devoted parenting. The whales are masters of evolution. 50 million years ago, their great ancestors walked the dry land. What adaptation, what willingness to change, to now become the most adept creatures plowing the ocean's depths. Maybe, considering where we find ourselves here on Earth today, there's something that we can learn about the whale's willingness to change, evolve, and live better on this blue planet. New Haven Harbour. Cheerful, friendly, picturesque, a popular place. But don't be deceived. This is a place full of ghosts, the ships of times past. Like the great Michael, Scotland's mightiest warship, the whole harbour was created by James IV as a naval dockyard. It was perhaps the most ambitious, the most capable ruler Scotland has ever had. He gave the country its first navy, and the Michael was the biggest battleship of its time. They say they cut down every tree in Fife to build it, except, of course, the king's own hunting forest at Falkland. Some things never change. But Scotland's king died fighting on the front line of the battle at Flodden Field. Michael wasted its prowess, raiding in Europe, filled with the guns that should have been at Flodden. Ghosts long gone now, the floors of the forest are all weed a war. David Octavius Hill came to New Haven in search not of ghosts but of a living community, a Victorian community, fishermen and fisherwomen. He had seen the community of Edinburgh's old town crumbling as prosperous folk moved out, creating new class divisions. But from his studio on Carlton Hill, he could also see New Haven, where the old shared traditions endured. David Hill was a painter but he was also caught up in the new technology of photographs, calotypes they were called. He felt there was a creative potential to record people in their own landscape, their seascape and their community lives. So he came here to New Haven with his technical partner, James Adamson, and they caught a moment in time people in time, ghosts now, but still somehow with us. Kalaroo, in winter winds howl and the sea rolling high, our boatmen so brave all dangers defy, their last haul on board they steer for the shore, 
Their live cargo loaded is soon at our door. Kalaroo, Kalaroo, Kalaroo frae the fourth, Kalaroo. Men's lives, the price of fish and women's labour. The herring loves the merry moonlicht. The mackerel loves the wind, but the oyster loves the dredging sang, for it comes o' the gentle kin. Eventually, dredging destroyed the oyster beds, though fishing is still alive on the fourth, and maybe the oysters can be brought back to be consumed again in taverns, knee-deep in claret. Not for David Hill, though, the artist of memory. There's no coming back for him. Having lost his own wife in childbirth, he saw his friend and partner, James Adamson, embark here at New Haven for St Andrews to die young. Hail the bark, never to return, wrote David. And here, Human life still meets the sea, time and tide, the rhythm of life, present and past, and memories setting sail on the water. Kalaroo, Kalaroo, Kalaroo frae the fourth. Why have you heard of the HMS Challenger? The ship after which the American Space Shuttle was named? Or Professor Challenger in the Lost World? Or perhaps because one of the men who made the Challenger famous lived here in Granton? That was John Murray. He was born in Coburg, Ontario, Canada. And at the age of 17, he came to Scotland to live with his grandfather, who was interested in science. Murray was a student at Stirling High School and then won a place to study medicine at the University of Edinburgh. John Murray had a tremendous sense of fun and as a student he was somewhat ill-disciplined, liking late night parties and not enjoying the early morning lectures. He was good friends with an equally ill-disciplined student, Robert Louis Stevenson, who described Murray as a wandering star someone who would amount to very little. How wrong he was. John Murray also had a tremendous sense of adventure. So when the opportunity to serve as a surgeon on a whaling ship heading to the Arctic came up, he seized it with both hands. He wasn't interested in the culling of whales. Murray was fascinated by the ocean and he collected many samples and he was fascinated by the geology as well. And on his return to Edinburgh, he changed courses and studied zoology and geology. But John Murray would never graduate, for in 1872, he accepted the post of naturalist on the Challenger Expedition. The Challenger Expedition was the first of its kind, gathering data on all aspects of the ocean, the marine life, the temperature, the currents and the geology of the seafloor. The expedition left Portsmouth in 1872 and returned in 1876. And John Murray took his pet parrot called Robert with him. He kept the crew and the scientists entertained. And during those four years, the Challenger traveled 70,000 nautical miles, discovered 4,700 new species of plants and animals, and calculated the lowest point on the ocean floor, now known as the Challenger Deep. It trawled and dredged and gathered many marine samples. And on its return, Murray was responsible for collating and compiling all the records of the Challenger expedition, a mammoth task. In 1884, John Murray set up the Scottish Marine Station here at Granton. There was a floating barge called the Ark, which had a laboratory aboard and was moored in a flooded tidal quarry. A steam yacht called the Medusa went out to collect soundings and a disused tannery was a laboratory and a library. And Murray himself lived at Challenger Lodge, which is now St Columbus Hospice. The Challenger expedition attracted many 
young students, and Murray was an inspirational figure to the young, one of whom was William Spears Bruce, who went on to lead the Scottish National Antarctic Expedition. The Marine Station moved to Millport and then on to Oban. Murray combined his sense of adventure with academic rigour, and he produced over 50 volumes of the Challenger findings and became known as the father of oceanography. But John Murray was a polymath. His interest in meteorology led him to found the observatory on top of Ben Nevis. And his interest in the physical properties of locks and bodies of water led him to research and survey all 562 locks in Scotland where he came upon locals steeped in the folklore that their lock was bottomless or the home of some benevolent monster. Tragically, John Murray died in a car crash in 1914, and his grave in Dean Cemetery in Edinburgh is the first in the world to have the word oceanographer carved upon it. Animals on sea and in land are named after Murray including the rather frightening looking, deep sea dwelling Murray Abyssal Angler Fish, whose name in Greek means black monster. Harbour seals swim regularly into Granton Harbour as efforts continue to improve the ecology and the water quality of the Firth. The father of oceanography would be proud, very proud. The island rose from the morning mists across the sand and the mudflats, right where the river met the sea. The woman was standing amongst the trees, gazing out towards it. She looked, but she didn't see. All around her was life. The very first greens in the trees, birds in the air, plentiful fish in the sea, and nearby her tribe that she was standing guard for were just waking up for the morning. But for her, it was cold and empty. But then, she saw a figure, a man wading across the mud flats with his boots in his hand towards the shoreline. When he got to the shore, he climbed up on the other side of the river from her. He took something out of his pocket. It was a gleaming white bone flute. He looked up and down the empty shore and started to play. And something in those notes, in that tune, pierced through her. And when the man put the flute away and started to walk along the river, she followed. The woman walked up the river, following the man on the other side, staying hidden by the trees. In the evening, the man set up camp and started playing his flute, the noise bouncing off the trees. Hesitantly, the woman went into her pocket and pulled out a bone flute. And with rusty, hesitant fingers, she started to play, echoing the man. The next day in the evening, she stepped out from among the trees and as they played, they sat on both sides of the river, looking at each other. 
on the third day. At a shallow and narrow bit of the river, the woman waded across and they continued up along the river together. As they traveled up, the river got smaller and the woodland sparser until there was just the wee burn. And eventually they came to a cliff side full of caves. The woman knew the way. She clambered up the rocks to a big cave mouth. There she peered in, took a careful sniff, took out her flute and played a couple of tunes listening to the echoes. And then she declared it safe. The she-bear had gone for the summer. They went inside the big cave and made their home. A few weeks later, the tribe came up, her family. They were overjoyed to find her again, who they thought lost, and to see her happy, laughing again. Autumn came, the very last of the leaves still hanging on in the trees. And that's when the woman retreated deep into the cave with all the other women of the tribe and her family. The man waited at the mouth of the cave and he waited and finally he heard the lusty loud cry of a healthy baby. And he looked down, sighed. He packed his things, folded away the blankets and furs he had borrowed. And on top of that pile, he left a brooch of gleaming yellow metal with stones of red and shining blue. And next to the brooch, a flute that he'd been carving for the last months, beautiful white. He left, walking down the river, all the way to the shore where the river met the sea. And there he set up camp, sitting on the lonely shore gazing out towards the island for a day, for two days. But on the third morning, when the tide was low, he got up, took off his boots and carrying them waded across the flats towards the island, disappearing into the mist. Later, when the first greens were just appearing on the trees, the woman was standing among the trees, looking out to the island, pointing at the island to show it to the baby strapped on her back. She reached in her pocket and took out a beautiful carved gleaming bone flute, lifted it to her lips and started to play a merry tune. And her playing echoed across the shore and the flats and into the woods. And the laughter of the baby bounced of the waves and the flats as she played. Three mighty bridges span the River Forth from South Queensferry to Fife, the Forth Railway Bridge, the Forth Road Bridge and the Queensferry Crossing. Here I think the Firth of Forth ends and the River Forth begins, meandering all the way up to Stirling 
and towards the Trossachs. But this new crossing bears the name of one extraordinary woman, Margaret, Queen and Saint. Margaret came from Hungary, but she was brought up at the court of Edward the Confessor in Westminster. She was a royal princess, but also the best educated woman in the whole of medieval Europe. But then Edward died, William the Conqueror seized power and she had to flee for her life. She became a refugee like today's Ukrainians. Now some say that she was making for Hungary, but others that she remembered meeting Malcolm, King of Scots, when he was a hostage at the court in London. Whatever, there was a great storm. Her ship was driven into the Firth of Forth and she landed on the North Shore. Malcolm came down from his castle at Dunfermline to meet her. He offered her sanctuary and then quickly his hand in marriage. Here was a life-changing choice. Should she fulfill her vocation as the abbess of some great European foundation? Or should she marry into this northern kingdom with its endless conflicts. She chose Malcolm and Scotland. But Margaret didn't give up her vocation. As Queen of Scots, she improved conditions for prisoners of war. She brought up orphans along with her own children. She encouraged arrows and children alike to learn to read. And she retained her own identity. At Dunfermline, she had her spiritual retreat, her cave, her desert. She respected the old Celtic sacred places at Rusteneth and St Andrews while also bringing European traditions, the Benedictines, to Scotland. And here at the Binks, she established her ferry to encourage pilgrims to cross over to Dunfermline and on to St Andrews. This building, the Pilgrim Church of St Mary of Mount Carmel, is her most fitting monument, a woman in a man's world who did not seek celebrity or power, but influence on everyone, high and low, for the good of the country. No one in the palace knew where the queen had gone. She hadn't been with them long, but now it seemed for no reason at all, she had vanished. A flurry of panic flew around the royal court, spreading like wildfire. The soldiers were summoned, those on foot and those on horseback, the servants too. They were to search for the missing queen and King Malcolm, his worry, turned to anger. Where was his queen? Who had taken her? How dare they? He would have their head. The soldiers and servants were sent east, west, north and south to search for Queen Margaret. Boats were launched over the river forth, soldiers venturing into the kingdom of Fife. The peace of the land was broken everywhere. Cries rose up, Margaret, Margaret, where are you? Back in the palace, the queen's throne was bare. Her place at the royal table was empty and even her soup was turning cold. 
We Kirsty. The gardener's daughter heard the commotion, the weeping and the wailing, saw that even her old father was sent into the woods with the searchers. The silence of the place was broken. Margaret, Margaret, where are you? The searchers shouted, causing birds to fly from their nests and foxes to bolt from their dens. Kirsty wandered away from the cries of the searchers and she drifted towards the river. And there she bent to pick daisies and she wove herself a bonny daisy chain necklace. To Kirsty, this was more beautiful than any fine jewels. And she wandered on, but then stopped to hear a bird singing. But this was no bird that Kirsty knew. And being a gardener's daughter, she knew her birds. And because the good Queen Margaret had arranged schooling for the likes of wee Kirsty, she knew not only their songs, but she could write and spell their names, the Mavis, the Linnet, the Wren. Following the enchanting sound, Kirsty padded over the meadow, her bare feet making not a sound. By now, she could hear words, but where they were coming from, she could not tell. She crept a little closer and stood transfixed, listening to the soft murmurings. Dear Lord in heaven, blessed be the people of Scotland. May all wars cease. May no more blood be shed in your name. May the crops increase. May the rivers and seas teem with fish. Blessed be the people of Scotland. Peace, peace, peace. Kirsty looked about her, enchanted. She pinched herself to check she wasn't dreaming. Had she stumbled upon an angel? She looked around to see where this murmured chanting was coming from. And there was a cave close by. Kirsty crept a little closer and the chanting sound continued. Peace, peace. And may I, Margaret, prove a worthy servant. Then Kirsty knew. Should she run back to the palace and alert the soldiers and tell them that the good queen was safe? Or should she herself go into the cave and tell Queen Margaret that many, many were searching for her and that as a queen of Scotland, her place was in the palace next to the king? A queen, should Kirsty alert her, should not wander off. But then Kirsty smiled. She herself was forever wandering off, listening to the birds singing, gathering wildflowers. So why not a queen? Kirsty slipped away. And behind her, the murmurings continued. Peace, peace, peace. Blessed be the people of Scotland. And Kirsty fled back to the palace, 
leaving the good Queen Margaret to her peace and solitude. It was a different story back in the royal court. None of the servants or soldiers had found Margaret. And by now, King Malcolm was convinced that his beloved queen had been captured. Whoever has kidnapped her will suffer, roared King Malcolm. Whoever has taken the queen, bellowed, the chief of the soldiers will die at our hands. A queen should be here in the palace beside her king, bellowed the king's advisor. The place was in an uproar. No one expected wee Kirsty, the gardener's daughter, to step forward in the hubbub with her bare feet, her ragged skirt, her daisy chain looped around her neck. And she coughed for their attention and then spoke out boldly saying, our queen is speaking with God and will be back with us all soon. A hush fell upon the royal court. A pin falling on the floor would be louder than the silence that followed brave wee Kirsty's declaration. Everyone turned to stare at the gardener's daughter. And it was King Malcolm who finally understood. Of course, before marrying Margaret, she had spent most of her life in prayer. Why would she change now? Because she was his queen. And he stood up and announced to the assembled courtiers, servants and soldiers, our queen is in prayer, in some secluded spot. And he smiled. And his calm spread to everyone and saw the earlier woe and anger turned to relief and joy. Meanwhile, Wee Kirsty had taken from her apron a slate and with chalk had written the words, Blessed be the people of Scotland. And with a curtsy, she presented it to the king. He laughed merrily and he fell to his knees and thanked her. We will not disturb our queen, he assured her. And then with a wink added, if you should see the lovely Margaret, tell her, her leek and tatty soup is getting cold. And as for wee Kirsty, well, there are many children like her still, listening to the birds sing, gathering wildflowers, skipping and playing the length and bonny breadth of Scotland. Margaret's last sad crossing was here at Queensbury. She was under siege in Edinburgh Castle after Malcolm was killed in battle. Her body had to be smuggled out of the castle and across the river to Dunfermline. But she's remembered now as the patron saint of our blue city. And these three great river crossings are in her memory and honour. They connect Scotland up as a nation and open us up to the wider world. And that's what this blue city, this blue planet does. 
joining our life to that of the oceans where our common future lies. Our journey now is done along Edinburgh's coastline, but you too, wherever you live, can join our exploration of the Blue City.